In our last lesson, we learned that when we were baptized into Christ, we put on Christ. That is to say, we became associated with Christ in the eyes of our Heavenly Father God. When he sees Christ, he sees you too. He cannot, in fact, consider Christ without considering those that have been baptized into Christ. By putting on Christ, we come into an area where we appropriate the benefits that are administered by Jesus Christ. His primary benefits are depicted in the New Covenant, where he writes his law upon your hearts, puts it into your mind, thereby bringing you into agreement with God, giving you that unanimity with God where you think like he doesn't agree with him and love his holy law, where in fact you want to do his will and his commandments are not grievous. There as we put on Christ, fleshly distinctions are done away. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, and there is no inhibition in anyone that is in these various social divisions. We thank the Lord that we have been baptized into Christ and have put on Christ and have become heirs according to the promise. Now today we want to touch upon something that is very vital to you. A great deal of controversy rages around this subject, but I trust that none will be raging around it for you. You received the Holy Spirit of God when you were baptized. Your baptism should be a constant source of remembrance, of thanksgiving, and an area where you develop confidence before God. In it, you have been identified with Jesus Christ himself. You have been identified with God the Father himself. And you have been identified with the Holy Spirit of God. Our text is found in Acts, the second chapter, and verse 38, where Peter announced to penitent people, those that believed the gospel and wanted to come away from guilt and transgression, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a divine commitment, the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Peter. If you repent and are baptized for the remission of sins, I will give you my Holy Spirit, God is saying. That's a divine commitment that you can count on being fulfilled. God himself wants to give his Holy Spirit to men. This is one of the great consolations of Scripture when you read it, an index to God's character. God does not delight in withholding things from his people. He has a yearning in his heart to give his Holy Spirit to his offspring, those he created in his own image, and in particular, those that are in Christ Jesus, who have embraced the gospel by believing and being baptized, obeying from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered to them. God introduced us to his longing to give men his Holy Spirit in the prophets. It was veiled at first, difficult to perceive, few in fact understood it. Let me give you two or three of these prophetic statements about God giving men his Holy Spirit. The first is found in the book of Isaiah, the 44th chapter, and verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. Now God interprets what that means. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. God makes a commitment here. He unveils the future. I'm going to pour out copiously my spirit upon mankind, upon the seed of the covenant. I'm going to do this upon those that are in a favorable relationship with me. I am going to convey my spirit to them. Ezekiel also prophesied of this unprecedented gift in Ezekiel the 36th chapter and verse 27, where God promises, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. What a commitment this was. Joel the prophet, whom Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost in Acts the second chapter, said in his prophecy, the second chapter in verse 28, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. The 
These were veiled promises, difficult to discern, but they whetted the appetite of the godly. Those ancient Jews, as they read those promises, the prophets that received them, must have tingled with anticipation as they heard of God giving his Holy Spirit to mankind. What an unparalleled benefit, the Holy Spirit of God given copiously to men. Prior to the administration of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit was associated with key individuals. He was associated with Moses, who gave the law, and with the prophets, and with other key persons in Scripture. But here in the prophets, God promises that there was going to come a day when he would, without discrimination, display his spirit and his love by conveying his spirit and pouring it out upon all flesh, all people within the covenant, no discrimination, no favored people. If people were in the covenant and baptism into Christ puts you into the covenant, they would have the Holy Spirit poured out, that is, without reservation, copiously and plenteously upon them. When Jesus Christ came to earth, the great deliverer of mankind and tabernacled among us, he walked among us as God manifest in the flesh and unveiled to us in unparalleled measures the heart of God. He spoke of this giving of the Holy Spirit and of the lack of reluctance on the part of God to do this. In Luke, the 11th chapter and verse 13, Jesus made a statement that has been misinterpreted by many today, but uh, we want you to see how this unveils the desire of God. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now, the meaning of this text is that God was about to come into an era of time where he would have no reservation about giving the Holy Spirit to those that received and embraced his gospel, to them that ask him. This is something the prophets never realized. It's something that Moses never realized. Yet Jesus promised that God was going to be released from inhibition in this. There was, it was going to be legal and right for God to give his Holy Spirit to those that would ask him. In John, the seventh chapter, verses 38 and 39, Jesus Christ announces it once again. There as he stood in the great day of the feast and saw multitudes of people coming to him, he cried out, he said, if any man thirst, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now the gospel writer wrote some years after Jesus spoke that statement. There is a silver-head John the apostle in the latter part of his life wrote this gospel. He recalled this pronouncement by Jesus. If any man thirst, let him come unto me, and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water as he drinks what I have to give him. And John, constrained by the Holy Spirit, interpreted that wonderful promise and invitation of the Lord Jesus. This he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But Jesus anticipated the giving of the Spirit. And so charged with the joy and anticipation of that giving, he challenged men, even to this generation, to come to him. Those that feel a lack inside that thirst, come to me and drink. Take what I have. Take the truth that I bring from the Father. Receive from me the commitments that I'm giving you that God has made, and I will give you my Holy Spirit. That was Jesus Wonderful promise. This was the well springing up within that Jesus mentioned to that woman of Samaria in John the fourth chapter and verse 14. Here again you see the heart of deity that is anxious to bestow his spirit upon mankind. John the fourth chapter and verse 14. Whoso drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That is to say the source of life will be internal. I will merge life with your spirit. You yourself will be alive 
and life will issue from within. This is speaking of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus told that woman, if you knew who you were speaking with, you would have asked of him water and he would give it to you. Jesus has a desire to bestow life, Holy Spirit life, unto those that come to him. So there is no difficulty with God. There is no difficulty with Christ. There has in Jesus Christ been full provision made for God without reservation to give you his Holy Spirit. Jesus made the commitment and it can be trusted. Now the position of the Holy Spirit in those that are in Christ Jesus, to those that have been baptized into Christ, the apostles reasoned on this wise. They knew that these people had the Holy Spirit of God. Now let's see some of their reasoning. In Romans the 8th chapter and verse 9, and you want to believe this applies to you. Baptized believer, brother or sister in Christ, these statements are made of you that are in him. Romans the 8th chapter and verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now to clarify this matter, that the Holy Spirit is not only for some of God's people, it's not that some people in Christ have the Spirit and some don't. The apostle adds, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So if you're Christ's, you have the Holy Spirit. Verse 16 describes the role that the Holy Spirit plays and how closely knit he is with your spirit. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit has been merged with your essential person. And he testifies inwardly with your spirit so that your spirit sees the sense of that, that it makes sense to you. It's reasonable to you. You see it and understand it and perceive it. You're a child of God. That confidence is a result of the Holy Spirit from within bringing you into agreement with the living God. Verse 23, the Holy Spirit's presence is again mentioned. And not only they, that is the inanimate creation that are waiting for deliverance, not only they, but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. The Holy Spirit creates a dissatisfaction for the temporal order in your heart. And there's a longing, perhaps it's an unintelligible longing to some, but our job is to give intelligence to it, to make it sensible to you. The Holy Spirit causes you to yearn for heaven from within, for an eternal order, for a lack of temporality, where things do not pass away. Now the Lord also testifies in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, in verse 16, as he addresses the church of the living God. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Do you know that, believer, that in the church of God, the people of God collectively, the Spirit of God dwells within them? Oh, what a wonderful benefit is ours in Christ Jesus. Well, let's take that matter of the temple down to a more personal level. In 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, in verse 19, the apostles challenges your thinking. What? Know ye not? that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? And I ask you, do you know that? If you are unaware that the Holy Spirit dwells within you, we challenge you with these words. What? Don't you know this? Don't you know you have the Holy Spirit from God? That what Peter said happened to you. If you repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's a note of apostolic consternation if you don't know that, if you aren't aware of it and cognizant of it. I find these things to be wonderful, liberating truths, and I trust you do too. Now, the presence of the Holy Spirit may introduce some difficulties to some people, but I trust it does not to you. 
It's a matter of apostolic assertion. You must receive it by faith. Now, God has given his Holy Spirit to men. The Word is powerful on this matter, and we want you to hear it and to rest confidently in it. God has given us his Holy Spirit. Now, let's take, first of all, the divine assertions of this. The God has committed himself on this. Let there be no doubt. Be a believer of the Word here. Acts, the fifth chapter, and verse 32 this statement is made, if you have obeyed the Lord, this applies to you, believer. And we are his witnesses of these things. That is, that Jesus Christ has been exalted to be a prince and a savior and to give repentance and salvation and remission of sins. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God hath given to them that obey him. Now, there's an inspired verse. The Holy Spirit gave that to Luke to write because he wanted the church to know it. God has given his Holy Spirit to them that obey him. If you obeyed him, you received the Holy Spirit. Another text is found in Romans, the fifth chapter, in verse 5. Now, reach out. Reach out and grasp these things. This is liberating truth, and if you know it, it will make you free. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. Here the apostle assumes that you know this, but you must capitalize upon it. You must be receptive to him, not quench him, not grieve him. One of the more intimate texts that proclaim this is found in the book of 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter and verse 8. He therefore that despiseth despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Extremely personal and intimate. God has given unto us, without any reluctance, without any hesitancy, in fulfillment of his commitment through the prophets, in fulfillment of his promise through Jesus, in fulfillment of the promise of the gospel, he has given unto you his Holy Spirit. In 1 John, the third chapter, in verse 24, John takes up this matter, building a foundation for God's people to rest upon. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Again, in 1 John 4, in verse 13, hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Holy Spirit, not can do it, not will do it, not might do it. He has done it. He has given to us his Holy Spirit. Now the apostle in Galatians, the fourth chapter, says something about the giving of the Holy Spirit that unveils to us how personal that gift is, how intimate it is, and how much a part of you the Holy Spirit is. Galatians, the fourth chapter, verses four through six, announced to us that when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. That is to say, he was flesh and blood, subject to the restrictions of mankind, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons... God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Your heart is the inmost part of your person. Now, man is extremely complicated. The most external part of him is his body, his flesh. But the most internal part of him, the citadel of his spirit, is his heart. And God has sent his Holy Spirit into your heart where your motives are developed, where your understanding resides, where your perception is. We thank God that he has done this, sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts, not upon our heads, not upon our bodies, not so that we have a tingling sensation, but in our hearts where we can have fellowship with the living God. Believers are the temple of God, and the presence of the Holy Spirit there is just as real, 
God has just as really sent the Holy Spirit as he sent Jesus into the world. He has been identified with your spirit and dwells within your heart. Collectively, all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ, collectively are the temple of God. According to 1 Corinthians 3.16, and the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We're made a habitation of God through the Spirit. Ephesians 2.22. Individually, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Use it wisely. Heaven's messenger dwells within. The Holy Spirit's ministry is not mystical or mysterious or strange. It's outlined for us in Scripture, and if you assess your life properly, you can find evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart. The Word of God confirms to us that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, Romans 8 and verse 16. By that he means to say you can have confidence and assurance that you belong to the Lord and the Lord belongs to you. You can have boldness to approach unto the Lord. The Holy Spirit confirms to you the truth. It's not a fable that you're the Son of God. You are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And the Holy Spirit attests to the truth, what really is, believe his witness. The Holy Spirit also provides strength for the inner man. Ephesians, the third chapter in verse 16, tells us that God strengthens us with might by his Spirit in the inner man. There in the inner man, he fortifies us with divine strength. Now, in the next few verses of that text, Ephesians, the third chapter, he outlines for us something of what is involved in this strength and spiritual fortitude. He strengthens us with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able with all, to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now what this means is that the Holy Spirit, as he strengthens and fortifies your inner man, enables you to think properly about divine relationships. He makes you strong in your reasoning powers and in faith so that you become perceptive. You're able, in the words of that text, to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth, or to put it in contemporary language, to see the implications of Christ's exaltation and vicarious death for you. You can make an association between what Christ did and what's available to you in Christ Jesus. That's spiritual strength and fortitude. Now, the Holy Spirit leads you also to subdue the works of the flesh. And right here is where we begin to be intensely personal. You possess a nature that is contrary to God. It's called in Scripture the old man or the carnal nature. It's something that is to be crucified or denied expression, that part of you which tries to assert itself against God and tries to wed you to this world. The Holy Spirit of God will lead you to subdue the works of the flesh. In the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, in verse 13, these words are given. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die, that is, be separated from God. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now you can believe this in ways that will be perceptible to you. The Holy Spirit of God will enable you to squash the expressions of sin, to put off, as James put it, the superfluity or outbreak of naughtiness, or evil desires, those thoughts that come to you that you hate and that you dread, the Holy Spirit will give you the ability to cast them down, to get rid of internal things that interfere with your fellowship with God and to subdue the expressions of the flesh. What a benefit God has given us in his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit also brings joy. 
The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not in doing things, in certain dietary habits, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces a joy. It's a rational joy. He shows you the glory of the gospel. What has been accomplished by Christ Jesus, your sonship and your unity with the Godhead, and you begin to rejoice in God. As the Apostle Paul put it, I joy in God through the atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit also brings hope. Romans 15, 13 says, We abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you sow to the Spirit, if you yield to Him and culture sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, Galatians 6, verse 8 says, If you sow to the Spirit, you will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Here is a personal messenger from heaven, God's own Holy Spirit, that was given to you when you were baptized. He gives you the cutting edge of life. He enables you to make it to heaven without being distracted by the evil one. Now let's review very briefly what we have found in this wonderful lesson. We have found that God wants to give his Holy Spirit to men. He does not do it out of a sense of obligation. You do not have to beg him to do it. He gives it to those that obey him. That's his commitment. He made it through the prophets. He announced it through Jesus, confirmed it through the apostles. When the Holy Spirit comes into you, he comes into your heart, where your motives, where your aspirations, where your love loves, and where your longings reside. He teaches you there to rationalize properly about the things of God, to perceive truth in the gospel and not fable. He opens up Jesus to you. He opens up God to you. He confirms your sonship to you so that you can throw your shoulders back by grace and say, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he can keep what I've committed to him against that day that's on schedule for the future. Now I admonish you as a child of God to receive this truth that we've given to you. Quench not the spirit. Don't grieve the spirit by which you've been sealed unto the day of redemption. The matter now is in your hand. You can believe God for these things and go on your way rejoicing, or you can doubt him and be thrown into consternation. Which, brother or sister, will you do?